Thank you. The app is really cool, by the way, because it uh, doesn't require any login, and it's like super easy to start using. So love that. Anyway, let's talk about CI/CD and uh, how to be successful with it. Hopefully, um, through a series of some practical tips and tricks. But before we get into the deep end, let's have a little thought exercise. Imagine that uh, you're getting ready to deploy some software. Something you worked on for uh, maybe a couple of days, maybe a couple of weeks. May I hope not more than a couple of months, but some people do that anyway. Uh, let's say that everything is ready. You've written your tests, everything is passing, security is happy, um, the whole team is happy, the organization can't wait for you to release this so they can start uh, making more money, and all you need to do is really press that big red button here. Prover proverbial big red button, anyway. But still, we can imagine. We can imagine that it has a nice little click, like a nice mechanical keyboard, also doing a little tactile feedback to it. And once you do it, it's, uh, it's really out of your control. And uh, the software that you have written is being deployed into production. And in a few moments, maybe a few minutes, maybe in a few hours, depending on what you're actually doing, it will be in the hands of your users. And uh, you will start seeing some indication on your dashboards of how it's actually gone. Now, the first few moments are usually quite quiet. You just wait for it to start showing up. And then uh, you have a couple of more options. Option one, you keep holding your breath in silence and uh, wait for it to blow up. Uh, I hope you don't go blue in the face because that's bad health-wise. Uh, or option B, you pack up, go home, or to the pub, and enjoy the sunshine, because I'm told it's quite rare in here. Anyway, um, or it could also be Friday at 4 p.m., and yeah, it's time to go home, right? After you've done your deploy. Anyway, I prefer B more than A for uh, various reasons. I hope you do too. And, uh, but they're not too different, one from another. And the difference between them two, it really just boils down to automation. How much of automation you have in place, and uh, how much do you trust that automation that you have in place. And this, my friends, is not only something that's only applied to software. It can be applied to manufacturing. It can be applied to business processes, or even agriculture. And while this talk is not about agriculture, I do like to compare software delivery and agriculture because, believe me, it's, they're quite similar in some regards. For example, let's say you have a field. It's a big field. You can do everything by hand, right? Or by humans directly. So people planting the seeds, people uh, weeding the plants, people uh, doing everything harvesting, watering, all of that. Um, or you can do a lot more with a lot fewer people. You can just employ some tractors, uh, employ an irrigation system, maybe, um, maybe use some fertilizers. You get more done with less people, and also through um, you, you get more predictable results. And naturally, the um, couple of steps, taking a couple of steps forward from this, you end up in this super high-tech uh, greenhouse. I imagine this is uh, pretty normal for a Dutch farming standards anyway. But essentially, this uh, greenhouse, what it does is it does automate everything. It controls the gas, gas mixture, it controls the lighting, the temperature, uh, the nutrients that are fed to each individual of these plants. And I imagine these uh, cool robot hands, they use computer vision to detect which of them are uh, the ripest and then pick them up so you can sell them for the highest profit. And that is what I like to compare with a finely tuned CI-CD system. 
all the automation in place that you trust will give you the best results in the most predictable manner with the least amount of human effort. And, uh, and yeah, everything happens in isolation. All you need to do is provide the plants for, uh, or seeds for the plants to grow. Then you just ka your way uh, out of it. Or they can malfunction. And while I don't think that these robot hands are going to turn into these kind of giant robot dinosaurs and turn against humanity anytime soon, um, they can certainly ruin your crops if they misbehave, if they're misconfigured, or uh, as well as your deployment, your, your piece of software, if, it's, uh, if your automation for software delivery is misconfigured, it can ruin your user's day, and therefore your day as well. So you don't get to go home at 4 p.m. on a Friday, uh, but you have to go fix, uh, well, fix your mess, basically. Anyway, but fret not. We're not going to see those dinosaurs anytime soon, because uh, we're basically, it's always our fault to, wh whenever we misconfigure some software, so it's never the machines mis misbehaving on their own, and uh, yeah, the same with agriculture and the same with CI/CD. Speaking of machines misbehaving because of, uh, because of humans, my name is Dan. I'm a developer advocate at CircleCI, and uh, I've broken too much software to count. Anyway, pretty active on Twitter, so if you want to follow me, uh, go on there. If you have any uh, deeper questions, just sign at CircleCI.com. Anyway, I work for Circle. Ah, sorry, I work for Circle CI. We're a CI/CD platform, uh, the leading dedicated CI/CD platform in the world. Uh, we've, we've been around for a few years, so over 10 years, and uh, we help teams pretty much anywhere, of all sizes, of all technologies, build and ship software faster, more securely, and more reliably. We also have uh, some really cool stickers downstairs. We're running some really cool raffles, so please check us out downstairs. We have a booth and come talk to us. We're also doing a party tonight, but more about that later. Anyway, this is a talk about CI CD. It's not necessarily a talk about Circle CI. Um, we're going to be talking about more general uh, topics. From what I've found out from talking to uh, a bunch of people earlier today, everyone knows what CI is. So let me just go through the most important things. Um, continuous integration, the first part of CI CD, takes you from code in a repository that gets pushed onto some kind of built application, service, binary, whatever. A uh, few important things here. We're doing everything in an isolated environment, so this kind of runtime that gets spun up and tor torn down each time a job is uh, completed. We're running a series of automated steps, like tests, verifications, security scans, etc. And uh, we're doing, we're, we're configuring everything as part of the same repository, so configuration is code, uh, we use YAML in particular with CircleCI, um, but yeah. So you might have this type of this type of pipeline set up for you. Um, quite a lot of steps, and then you can go a few steps further even and deploy this automatically. Have the automation in place to deploy this automatically, and that's where CD or continuous deployment or continuous delivery comes in, uh, where the idea is to yeah take whatever you built and orchestrate it so that it gets to wherever your environment is, uh, whether it's testing QA, whether it's internal kind of environment, whether it's uh, production or anything in between, and how it gets there, uh, how you handle all of that. Anyway, it's quite a lot, right? Quite a lot of steps, quite a lot of moving parts, and uh, that's the point, right? We want to have this huge amount of automation, and uh, but we also want to trust it, we want to rely on it uh, to release our software better. Anyway, for that, let's disentangle uh, some of those steps into n different dimensions and look at them separately. So first dimension that usually comes into mind to people is speed. So how fast this thing goes. Can we go faster than the person in front? Um, yeah, so that's usually what most developers think about when they're thinking, is my CI CD tool working for me or against me? Is it slowing me down? <coughs> and uh, it's completely fair point. 
And yeah, this is essentially time to run a CI CD pipeline, time to run your tests, time to get the feedback into a pull request that you've opened so that your colleagues can review it and say, okay, all the tests have passed, we're happy to merge this, we're happy to go, uh, go and release this. But there is more to this. There is also an aspect of recovering from a failing build. So if you have uh, this uh, um, trunk model, essentially, you don't want your trunk branch to, or main branch, default branch, whatever it is, um, to be broken, essentially. You want to verify everything before it gets merged, because that's where you kind of ship from. So if your, if your main branch or default branch is broken, then your CI CD pipeline won't run, so you can't get a last minute bug fix uh, whenever you need to get it out. So that's why it's very important to really minimize this time to increase the speed of how we recover from a failing build. And the last one is an organizational one. We all want to ship features. We all want to ship them faster. Our bosses want us to ship them faster. So um, that's something we also want to think about when we're thinking about CI CD success. How quickly can we do think, can we work as an organization? Um, I don't want to use the A word here. Agile. Um, anyway, running things faster. So the most basic, the most obvious of the dimensions. First one is use the resources that make sense for your builds. If you have, a, uh, let's say, a compilation step, compilation job, that can utilize that has like a multiple modules, for example, like a Gradle or Kotlin project. You know, you have multiple modules. You that can probably use multiple um, CPU threads at the same time. So, giving it more uh, resources will result in things running faster. The same with tests. The same with everything. Uh, same with RAM. So, if you're running into out of memory errors, you can probably just think about increasing your RAM. If you're on a cloud based tool, that's like one line change usually. And uh, I would encourage you to ex experiment with that. Second one is uh, do things once and not multiple times if you don't have to. So, I know I said that everything should happen in isolation, everything should be torn down, set up individually. But we can cheat sometimes, and by cheat I mean cache things so that uh, we really don't uh, duplicate our work. What can you cache? Ca you can cache dependencies. So any project that you use will have external dependencies from open source libraries to proprietary libraries to your own uh, pre-built libraries. You can think about how far you can go with each individual run compared to how what has actually changed, and only, only build and, uh, and re-download the things that are actually new. So that's where caching comes in. And uh, every single programming language, every single tool has their own way of doing it. So really, I would encourage you to check it out, understand how and where things are being uh, loaded and uh, stored, and then pass them on to subsequent builds. Um, Thirdly, run things in parallel. Uh, in this brave new cloud-based world, we have this enormous uh, amount of resources at our disposal that uh, can just be spun up and torn down without us really doing much work. This means that we can run things in parallel as much as possible, which means you can run all of your different types of tests. So let's say you have unit tests, integration tests, uh, et cetera, security scanning jobs, you can have them run in parallel so that you get the end results as fast as possible as, as opposed to running one after the other. And then you collate the results. The other one is if you have a long running test suite, you can think about running individual, like a uh, running subset of tests parallel on, on like parallel jobs. We call that test splitting. And uh, again, an hour worth of tests can be six minutes in across 10 parallel jobs. That's a significant time saving. And lastly, think about what needs to run and when. So if you're working on a feature branch, for example, um, maybe you don't want to run the whole integration test suite. You don't want to run the whole functional test suite uh, across multiple mat a whole matrix of devices. Maybe you just want to run the unit tests and like some smoke tests, which will run for, I don't know, 10 minutes as opposed to two hours, three hours. That's when 
you can still move all those kind of expensive workloads either to when you are actually merging into your uh, main branches or even running them separately from the from the development flow. Let's say you do it an, as a nightly recurring job that's kind of like verifying your work uh, after you're kind of finished, you're actually working on it. And in the morning, you have some actionable steps to take if that uh, job fails. Super useful. And you know how I said it's all, a, it's all a race? It's not really. Because the thing is that with CI, CD, you should be thinking more about it as an ambulance or like an emergency, uh, emergency vehicle as opposed to a race car because it should absolutely go fast, but it also has another job. It, and that job is to carry the signal, carry that payload about your tests. Is your software qu high quality enough for you to actually ship it? So find that balance. It depends on every team. It depends on every project. And, uh, and see how it uh, can be... Um, kind of what, what kind of balance you can find that works for you. And lastly, uh, when you see something break it, broken, if you see the red lights flashing, go fix it ASAP. Because if you can't fix it, then you can't, if you don't fix it, you can't ship it. Um, speaking of not being able to fix something, uh, this is central London uh, on a good day. It looks pretty red, right? And uh, this is because our traffic is notorious. Imagine that there is one uh, tube line that breaks down or there's like signal failure, delays on it. This goes deep red within like half an hour. Everyone's calling Ubers, everyone's trying to get somewhere. And yeah, those ambulances aren't gonna get anywhere. So you're actually risking people's lives that way. And that's why I'm talking about when you see something broken, you really have to work on it as, as fast as possible in order to resolve that. To resolve that, you first need to identify what's gone wrong, what's the issue, and uh, so that you can actually uh, work on it. CICD platform can help you by giving you the insights that you need into what's happening with your actual pipelines, what's happening with your workloads, understand where the bottlenecks are. Let's say your pipeline has 30 jobs you want to identify the one that's failing or the one that's slowest, the one that's flakiest as fast as possible. So understand what kind of dashboard you have and uh, how are you going to look into them. Log everything. So um, by that, it's very specific to each individual programming platform, programming language, tools that you use. Every single compiler has a debug and verbose mode so you can see um, you can see quickly what's gone wrong. You just need to understand how do I to toggle this. And this is obviously very domain specific, very specific to your individual uh, use case. Um, speaking of logs, understand how you're going to get those logs out because I can see them in, in my, uh, my CI CD interface, but maybe you want to download them, maybe you want to grab through those logs, really understand, okay, maybe that's how I'm going to uh, analyze this. Compare with what you built locally, with what you built on the CI, and really kind of see whether there's a test failure, whether there's a scripting failure. And my favorite one is debugging builds as they fail, as opposed to running like 20, 30 commits, doing try fix, try fix two, try fix three. You can just kind of SSH into a running build if you have it. Uh, and uh, poke around the job, saying, hey, this container has uh, this weird state that I'm not expecting. So maybe do it like that. Um, so yeah, all of these things will help you recover or identify the failure, uh, triage the issue as soon as possible so that you're not losing time doing that and you can just uh, go immediately into the... Um, into rectifying this issue. Next up, it's more fun stuff. Uh, this is from Monkey Island, by the way, if anyone's played this. I hope you have. It's a brilliant adventure game, one of the funniest games in the world. Anyway, um, they lock you up, these kind of cannibals lock you up in this uh, hut, and you keep escaping through this uh, hatch in the, in the ground. 
Uh, so they kind of keep adding more and more advanced security measures. So this is like the, the first one is like just boarded doors. Second one, you have this chain. Third one is like this high-tech uh, vault door that says armed on it, and you still keep escaping through the hatch. What I'm talking about is obviously security and risk management and uh, how a CI CD platform can actually help you with that. Number one, uh, and I hope you already know this already, um, is keeping your credentials safe. And by safe, I mean keeping them out of your Git repositories because in the Git repositories, they're immediately compromised. If you have something like that, it's considered leaked. You can have your, your laptop uh, stolen or taken away and someone can just get all, your for all of your keys that are in your Git repositories, which is a terrible, terrible idea. That's why you can store them in a CI CD tool so they get injected as environment vari variables in your jobs. Speaking of injecting environment variables into jobs, you can decide which jobs get which environment variables. Let's say you're deploying to three different AWS environments. You have three different accounts. You only want the environment, the, the credentials that are relevant to that specific environment, especially when you're talking about production, obviously. So you want to you wanna really split those, uh, those uh, credentials as, as far as possible. So really kind of think about the least privilege that you need. Uh, there's been leaks, uh, unknown vulnerabilities where tools were leaking whatever environment variables had, were set up. So really understand where you're, where you're putting them and who has access to them. Speaking of access control, think about your team members. Who in the team it has access to deploying? Who in the team should have access to, for, uh, for reviewing certain things? You can really do this kind of fine-grained control as well. Really specify, okay, only my tech leads are able to initiate the deployment into production. Um, maybe you have a security team that needs to review every single, uh, every single build before it gets deployed into production. Maybe they can have a manual step where they need to go in and go through their checklist, review all the, all the security scans, results, and uh, manually click approve. That's also possible, something you can do. I know it's an automated process, but sometimes you need to, un you need to uh, involve some kind of manual governance in order to have this fully automated because you want to have that uh, deployment automated. And of course, I've mentioned automated and security scanning. So that's, this is like from your dependencies, everything in the chain, to your static code analysis, to your, um, let's say, your provisioning your infrastructure with Terraform. You can scan your Terraform co code for... Um, for uh, bad practices, essentially, and uh, dynamic application scanning, that's also, that's also possible. So really think about what can you include in your CI CD pipeline as, as, in, uh, as for automated scanning. <coughs> and once you've included everything, there is obviously more we could do, more beyond the CI CD flow. What I'm talking about is, uh, thinking where the changes go when they are uh, in production. So they go on some kind of uh, dashboards usually and uh, where the other team is looking at them, the ops team. And they would start looking at uh, your dashboards and saying, hey, there is some kind of uh, weird behavior. We've not seen that many crashes. Why is that, uh, why is that the case? If you... Uh, Flag your deployments. Let's say we've done a deployment today. This is the version. Um, and flag them in your uh, observability tools, which you can do, obviously. Um, they can say, OK, when we deployed 2.3.4, something has broken. So let's go back to a previous release. Let's, again, help you triage what's gone wrong, help you triage how to resolve this. So really help you flag issues uh, before they really start uh, happening to everyone. Um, I've talked about build and deploy information. You can also put it on the other side of the chain. Let's say you're working with a product manager. They want to know, like uh, they've got so many features that they work on, that they, they, they want to ship. They have so many bugs that they opened. 
So you can say, OK, this bug has been fixed in this particular deployment. This feature has been fixed in this particular deployment. And you can get that into their JIRA environment. And so everyone, not only your development team, can benefit from this. And uh, <coughs> this is really like something that's uh, uh, in that great talk with, uh, with the uh, airplane disaster. That was, that was a really good example of how to actually get that information out as much as possible. Um, and yeah, like who needs to know about it? What do you use for communicating? Do you use Slack? Just send it as a Slack message. Hey, there is a deployment going on. Hey, there is a deployment going on and we need your manual approval. Things like that. You can automate it so that information gets to whoever needs to have it uh, when they need to have it. <coughs> Speaking of uh, the team and the extended team, CICD is, I believe, uh, Believe me, uh, team responsibility. DevOps is not about technologies. DevOps is about the teams and how they work together and how we collaborate in order to ship the best software that we can. And uh, so it's not only the, on, on the whole team's responsibility, it's the whole organization's responsibility to really kind of have this basic understanding of what's going on, what are those developers using that uh, that's they're deploying with, what are they uh, using to flag our, um, flag our deployment in MyJira or whatever. <coughs> For that, you really want to spread that knowledge. Make sure that everyone at least has this basic level of experience and knowledge of your CI CD pipelines, whether it's just like, hey, we're running these tests. This is where the dashboard is. This is where the test which have failed. Usually, that's pretty well integrated and out of the box. but at least have your members look at your CI CD pipelines and configuration once in a while and understand why things are happening uh, when they're happening. Because if you have only one person responsible for it, that person goes on vacation. If you're that person, uh, you don't want to be called on your vacation because some pipeline has broken, probably. You want to have uh, as many people as possible understanding it. And lastly, you can think about your CI/CD configuration as an aid to onboarding. So let's say you have a new team member. Uh, you can either tell them to read through a bunch of docs about everything in your application or service or system, or you can tell them, hey, this is what we're working on. This is the pipeline. These are the tests. These are the steps that we're doing. These are the environments we're deploying to. Have a read through it, and then we can have a conversation about what's unclear or what you would like to have have some uh, explanation, uh, explanation on. And uh, yeah, so DevOps is definitely about people. But now let's go back in time to our initial uh, thought exercise about uh, the deployment that we did. What if it didn't go well? What if it's actually gone terribly wrong and you actually need to go back and fix it? How can this TICD thing help us do that? Because you know what? Even if you follow all the best practices, make sure that all the tests are passing, everything is done correctly, you will find an edge case, or your users will find an edge case. And yes, broken deploys will happen. And uh, what we can do is, by relying on CICD for our deployments, we will be automatically shipping smaller pieces of code will be shipping smaller increments more often so that we can revert smaller chunks of code more, more easily. <coughs> and uh, that will then allow you for faster recovery. What's a revert? Revert is basically can be as simple as going back to the previous commit that you know triggered the, the build that uh, worked, deployment that worked, that didn't have the issue, and just redeploy that. Um, that can be a revert. Sometimes it's more, uh, more, more complex than that, but usually the smaller they are, the easier they are to, um, to revert, which is super important. And yeah, allows you to favor smaller changes versus larger changes. And, uh, but the best thing for this is essentially just prepare for it, really. Have a plan. Not everything needs to be automated. Sometimes you can have a checklist and uh, go through that checklist every now, now, now uh, 
now or then, every few months, have the whole team say, now let's practice, we've missed the configuration, let's, we, we misdeployed something, how do we revert it? Do a dry run so that when it actually happens, you can do it. Which ultimately brings me to my final and last point, that CI CD success is all about being free to deliver the software that you're working on on the terms that you control, that work for you as a developer, for your team, for your organization. It lets you focus on quality because you're automating all your tests, you're automating as much as possible as opposed to toiling away, and uh, team well-being because they know that uh, they don't have to toil away on uh, automatable processes. It allows your organization to ship smaller things so you can adapt to changes faster, which is good. You have this self-documenting self process for deployment and uh, testing. And of course, uh, you can deploy on Fridays and uh, recover quite easily, hopefully. Anyway, this has been some practical tips and tricks for CICD success. As I mentioned, we do have a booth. Uh, check us out. We're doing raffles every single day at 3.15, so in like 25 minutes we're doing first raffle for that little baby Yoda there. <laughs> it's an awesome plushie, you should, you should, you should go and win it. Um, we're also having a raffle for a keyboard, Razer mechanical keyboard, you know, the clicky one uh, on Wednesday. So you enter once, you're in for whole three days. And also we're running this party tonight at a venue like five minutes away from here, so you should check, it out, check us out. And uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure. If you want any feedback, you want some swag sent to you, just fill in that form, circlesia.com slash zan, and we can sort you out.